I, I'm just absolutely delighted to have our next speaker here uh, for many reasons. Uh, one is that I love working with him, even though he's had me up here to Atlanta every single weekend this month <laughs> doing church work. Uh, but Tim Downs is the Southeast Conference Minister um, for the uh, United Church of Christ, and he has been here since how long? 1996, so, uh, and he is quite proud that uh, uh, one of the children of the SEC was Millard Fuller, and he'll talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the connections and ways that the uh, organization looks like, wh why we look like we do, why Habitat looks like we do, and how there's some UCC roots in there that can't be ignored if you want to understand who you are and what your organization are. So that's going to be one piece of his talk. Another piece of his talk is going to be about how to approach churches uh, for fundraising and volunteers uh, in the context of their other denominational and mission needs as well. So uh, without further ado, my friend Tim. Kirk, I'm going to go get myself a, um, a music stand. I will not be singing. I promise you. I need to say that for the last several times I've spoken, I've had the good fortune of pulling the speech immediately after lunch, immediately after dinner, or the very end of the day run, when the group is running behind. So I'm going to try to make up some time for you. And I'm going to do my level best to keep this as interesting as I can. Let me uh, begin with a simple word of thanks to each of you. The work you do is really essential. And I have been sitting here for the last two speakers. And as, I, as I've listened, I remembered what it was like for my 22 years of local church ministry, uh, when I served as a pastor called to Center City Churches, and I know how compelling the needs that you all are seeking to address were in the neighborhoods that I served. And I know how many ways I tried to get into the very conversations that you're having here and how very difficult that was. Uh, just a quick story, there was one point at which I was approached by Habitat for Humanity when I was pastor of a church in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and I said, uh, what can you do for us? Well, they said, we, we build houses, and I said, that's great, but my church is located in a neighborhood, and I live in this neighborhood, where 20% of the housing stocks deteriorated, where a majority of the people are low income, and we desperately need housing rehabilitation, which you've been talking about. And they said, oh, we don't do that. Now, at that time, they did not. And I said, well, this is not useful to me. I need these houses and these peoples to be served. I'm saying that to you because that will give me a segue to some of the things that are very important about how you approach churches. I do want to say a couple of things, though, before I go there, and that is, I deeply, deeply have appreciated and valued the great gifts of Kirk Lyman Barner. You are very fortunate to have a man like that working in your midst. He said kind things about me, which I appreciate. Thank you, Kirk. But I want to reciprocate from my heart. This is a very gifted man and is a part of an amazing vision. Let me say a word about this particular sanctuary. I know that Dwight Andrews, the, the pastor, um, spoke to you about these windows, but he didn't tell you the whole story. Uh, and I want to go from the sanctuary to talk about Millard Fuller and, and the impact he had on the United Church of Christ, because these are all of a piece. This sanctuary and these stained glass windows is devoted to the American Missionary Association, which in the middle of the 19th century was the largest organization seeking the abolition of slavery in the United States. I want you to think about that for a minute. The window above your heads is devoted to the first secretary of the American Missionary Association. 
here in Atlanta, Georgia, immediately after the Civil War ended, abolitionists from the North came down here and built this church to make a witness for racial justice. Are you feeling me here? That is the legacy of the United Church of Christ here in the South. Now, let me digress and go back. So you sit here on sacred ground. Millard Fuller was a member of Lynette Christian Church, Lynette, Alabama. And Lynette Christian Church was a congregation that became a part of this tradition. Now, I know we have, you're from Lynette, right? I recognize your picture. So you know that the history I have just named here and Lynette Christian Church, there was a bit of tension there. Am I right? Lynette Christian Church has, within the last several years, disaffiliated from the United Church of Christ, in part because of that history. But Millard Fuller, in a conversation or sermon I heard him give in Lynette, said to his church, the United Church of Christ opened my eyes to the world. But what he didn't say, that I will say to you now, is that in 1966, when the Southeast Conference of the United Church of Christ was being organized, that was effectively the integration of congregationalism here in the South, bringing together the black uh, convention of the South, uh, which was congregational black churches, and the white Southeast Convention of Congregational Christian Churches. When that happened, the first vote that was taking place to organize this conference was defeated by the white churches that said, we ain't going to be a part of that. In the intervening year, Millard Fuller and one of my predecessors traveled around the five-state area of this conference, twisting arms, knocking on church doors, and saying, in the name of Jesus Christ, there is only one right thing for us to do and that is come together, black and white, into the same denomination. Now, today you say, oh well, but back then, I promise you, that was radical. So in a sense, the work you are doing reflects the values of this man after whom your organization is named. And that's why I come to say thank you as a conference minister of the United Church of Christ, we are about the work together of justice, of building, of reconciliation. Now, having said that, let me shift to what Kirk told you I would talk about. The shape of churches is really, really changing. When I was ordained in 1974, Mainline denominationalism still was pretty strong. A lot of vibrance, a lot of money for mission. There, there was really not a sense of the lack or absence of resources. Today, whether you're Presbyterian, Methodist, Cooperative Baptist, Southern Baptist, United Church of Christ, Lutheran, I promise you, you are working in a context and environment where there is an awareness that our resources are really diminished. So the first thing I want to say to you about approaching churches is as you go to approach a church about supporting your work, you do not want the phrase ka resonating in your mind. This is not an ATM. Likely, this local congregation is a very financially stressed organization that has a denominational executive like me knocking on the door and saying, I need your support, and has you come in here saying, you know, we have this incredible mission. We need your money. It's not working. There's another way to do this work, and that's what I'm here to tell you because I'm learning this as a conference minister. One of the things I've said to my churches, and I'm going to say it to you too, is when I was a local church pastor for 22 years, 
I understood how utterly unimportant the conference was to me, and therefore how unimportant the conference minister was. And so when I became a conference minister, I really, I really sought to put on a, a cloak of humility, knowing that when I approach the pastor, I'm not sitting there saying, I'm the big boy, I'm the big dog, you need to listen to me. No, I'm there to say, how can I help you? Because when you're strong, I'm strong. That's a message that you all need to kind of get into your core. When I make you look good, I look good. I began by saying I served in churches that were serving these stressed neighborhoods. My denomination, the United Church of Christ, as committed as it is to social justice, can't deliver a local service the way you can. You can come in to a local church pastor and you can say, the first thing you need to do is listen, not talk. You've got something to hear. You need to hear that story from him or her. What is their story? What are their needs? And you can provide some, some real responses to those needs and you want to negotiate that with that person. It's a need, as I said to you when I was in my last church, we have distressed housing surrounding this church. I have people who are on the cusp of homelessness. How can you help me? That's what I need a response to. And you can help me. My denomination can. If I said to you, gosh, I have a bunch of high school students who are looking for a, a work camp, a work project for spring break, and gosh, we're looking at a couple of things. You have something? You have something. Help me out. The other thing I want to say to you, and Kirk and I talked about this briefly. When Kirk comes to me and says, we are organizing a group to do some housing work in, 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 in New Jersey to address Superstorm Sandy, I say, wait a, wait a minute. I'm organizing United Church of Christ to respond to disaster, and I'm raising money for that, okay? Now, having said that, should we be looking at each other as competing interests, or is there another way to approach it? And I would suggest to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, to remember that we are about the same work. And how do we begin to find the ways in which we can connect our respective missions? Because, once again, if we can find ways to collaborate, we do not need to diminish one another. We can strengthen one another. So, maybe what I should say when Kirk knocks on my door and says, Tim, I want to organize some people to go with the Fuller Center for Housing in New Jersey to address disaster as well. Kirk, I have a whole bunch of people in the national setting, the United Church of Christ, and I have a whole network of disaster response team in a five-state area, which I do. How about... We sit down together and figure out how to do this. Because I am working with Lutherans in disaster relief. I'm working with VOADs in all these, church, in all these states, yes. And I have people who want to do that. We can be mutually supportive. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end and then invite questions because again, we're short on time. I could go on, but I don't need to. As you approach local churches, I'm going to say to you, do not take your work for granted and be certain that everything you do, you do with excellence. I say this to my churches, do not give your people mediocrity. Pay attention to what you're doing. Do your homework. Listen to these banking officers. Learn what programs you have. Know your stuff. So when you begin to engage, to say to a pastor or to lay leaders, what are your needs? You are basically an emissary. You're, you're carrying some information to them about what resources are, resources are available in work crews, in loan uh, programs, in whatever. Be excellent and be prepared. Secondly, now this is going to sound odd, but, but I don't mean it to. It is just 
in my mind, self-evident. Remember that you're trying to identify the self-interest of the pastor or the church. What is their interest? What is their vision? How can you really speak to their need? And I kind of touched on that. What service opportunities do they need? Do they need an opportunity to collaborate with something overseas? My conference worked with the, center, uh, the, the Fuller Center for Housing and sending a little group to do housing in, in, in the People's Republic of, of Democratic Republic of Congo. Okay. I, I did get some feedback from our national staff about that, Kirk. Where they said, whenever you do that work internationally, you be sure to check with us because sometimes you're working with the wrong people and you need to be working with the right people. And that's, that's just a caution about any international work. Um, I've mentioned work camps, mission opportunities, housing rehabilitation. But the other thing I want to stress to you is I belong, and, and I say this out of a, a, a place of deep conviction, I belong to a denomination that had really gave itself to a commitment to Christian unity. So everything I do, I seek to do in collaboration with others. And in today's world, not only Christian unity, but interfaith collaboration. I would encourage you always to look for ways in which you can collaborate and build up those churches that you are seeking, with whom you're seeking to partner. So, let me just stop there. Uh, I've laid out some principles for you. Um, and, you know, I suspect some of you have some stuff to come back to me with. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You bet I would. But, you know, but I would do something more. Again, this gives you an orientation on me. The, the question is, if I came to you and said, I would like to re rehabilitate a house for one of the families in your church. I see that you're in a community that has, you know, has some, some need here. And would I be responsive to that, to that offer? Well, sure. But I would want to take it one step further and say, I, I really appreciate that. But I've got, you know, I've got five families in this church. And, and is there a way we can, we can think a little bit bigger together? What can we do? And how can I support you? That's the other side of it. I will ask that question. Okay. The question is, if you approach a church and the pastor says, you know, all of my, all of my leaders are just plumb tapped out. Everybody is, is, is committed. Everybody is working. I just, you're asking me for leaders and, and, and I don't have them. Okay. Your question is a superb one because it goes, when I said we're, we're living in a season of diminished resource, resources in the church, it's not just financial resources, it's also leadership resources. Every church I have served has had a dearth of leadership. The previous generations, I, I, I would often look at the people whose funerals I were conducting and say, these people are oaks of righteousness. These people were, were giants of faith. And the people who are here now are really, really overcommitted, overwhelmed. It's, it's a real issue. I believe, and this is not a direct answer to your question, 
But I believe if you come into a church that's not so depleted, it's on the edge of death, and there are many of those. Um, if you are able to, be, to basically tap the interest of people in, by asking them about their world and their community, you will inspire some response, even among, even among people who are overcommitted. You know, but remember I said you go in listening. You also listen to the lay leaders. If the church is located in a stressed neighborhood, people are, you know, tremendously self-conscious about crime, whatever it is. If you go there and say, what, what are the issues around you? They'll talk. And if there's a way to begin to, to, to draw them more further in, you, you will find leaders. They may not be leaders who have the full range of skills that you need. They may be elderly, they may be infirm, but that you will find some leaders. Um, it's hard work though, I need to say. Sure. No, no, no. question is if i if i was could could i you know if if you were hosting a breakfast to gather people together um would i be would i be willing to come and would i be willing to bring people first of all one of the keys there is food yes you give me a meal i'll come <laughs> uh, I, I, i've always said that food is a i won't talk about the other dynamic of church programming but i always said that food was one of them so so yes, I would. Right. But what I appreciate about what you're saying, and again, this is working with a church that may have some poor members or low-income members doing the rehabilitation in that neighborhood so they don't need to be displaced. That shows, to my mind, kind of an openness, a sensitivity to keeping the community stable. You take somebody, you take me out of the neighborhood I live in, I don't know much. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Right. That that is true. I would say the heavenly endowed ones also have a lot of people knocking on their doors. So you still need to make your case in a really compelling way. Any other questions? The question is, you know, our church, and this goes back to your, our earlier conversation about depleted 
leadership. People were just plain tuckered out. And, um, and you know, I, I've, I work with a lot of churches like that as a conference minister. Um, and that's a reality. And the question is, is there a vision sufficient to really overcome their depletedness? And, and I, you know, you hope there is. But you're the ones who, who are really there to try to identify that. Sure. But, excellent. Thank you. I cannot tell you how many times somebody will call me and say, I don't know if you remember, we had a conversation three years ago. Um, but I remember that, and can we, you know, I wonder if we could get back to that. It, it, because you don't have a commitment when you walk out does not mean it was a futile, uh, a futile visit. It means that you may have a relationship there. And you need to learn that wonderful art of making yourself present without being annoying. Now, annoying does not work, I want to say. <laughs> but, but being able to come in and be present and just say, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but my name is Terry and... We talked six months ago. How's it going? Yeah. Ooh, ooh, that's good. I, you know, I can tell you I don't like cold calls as one who receives them all the time. You cold call me on an email, I delete you. You cold call me on a, on a phone, I'm probably not going to pick up the phone, or I may say, well, I, let me say, I, you know, I'll get back to you. Um, it is helpful if you know somebody who knows somebody. If you know the chair of the deacon board, who says, you know, I'll tell my pastor that you'll be calling. Um, it's just, I know, again, as a local church pastor and as a conference minister, I am inundated with, with requests. And which ones do I respond to? The ones I respond to are the ones where, as Terry suggested, the relationship has been cultivated and tended to. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Some of my best friends. <laughs> Absolutely. Well done. Well done. And, and I do need to say to you, and, and this is just a, a kind of, this is really truly from my heart here in the South. In the South, the United Church of Christ and the Lutherans have a long, long history of collaboration around ministry, around disaster relief, and it's been a very rich part of the reason for that, very frankly, is both of us here in the South, the Lutherans and the United Church of Christ, are very minor voices. We are not Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists. We are, people say, a Luther wa? And, uh, and, so, and with me, they say, United Church of Christ? Oh, I have a brother who's Church of Christ? And no, it's a different one. At any rate, so thank you. So much. Thank you.